Hi guys, and welcome back to History of Vision Success. So we are talking about this big overarching topic of the terror state and did the, did the Nazis, did Hitler achieve um, his um, idea of creating a terror state when he took power from 1934? Now, the first thing I'm gonna talk about is the law and the court system. So the role of judges, the role of lawyers, how does he manage to effectively take hold of this system and use it to help him establish a terror state, okay? So when Hitler took over the presidency on the death of Hindenburg, um, there were no formal restraints on his power and he kept many of the existing structures of the Weimar Republic. Despite his interior minister, Wilhelm Frick, drawing up schemes for major administrative reform, Hitler is just not interested um, in developing a new structure, even if it would have been more coherent. And what we see him do with the law courts and with the law um, is what he does in many other aspects of his governance. He just uses old traditional systems that already exist and then he just changes them when he needs to, okay? So I'm gonna go through um, all of the main parts of this system and how they all work. And I'm going to just explain to you how Hitler uses them and what their role becomes under him in Nazi Germany. So you can use all of these points as evidence in an essay on his creation of the terror state to show how he manages to use or he doesn't use or he uses for his advantage or it's a criticism. Um, all of these, these, these areas I'm gonna run through about how effectively he establishes this terror state. So I'm gonna start with the Reichstag now. Under the Enabling Act, the Reichstag had granted legislative powers to Hitler, as we know, um, and only seven more laws were ever passed through the Reichstag. Every four years, it renewed the Enabling Act, and in November of 1933, um, a Nazi list of candidates was approved in a virtual plebiscite. This was designed to show the popularity of the regime. So what we find is the Reichstag actually becomes more of a platform for propaganda than anything else, anything real or solid or legitimate. They just use it basically as an applauding platform for Nazi speeches. Second thing I'm going to run through is the cabinet, okay? So the cabinet. Now, like the Reichstag, the cabinet is retained, but increasingly lost its purpose. Initially, it contained three Nazis, but this gradually increased. However, some non-Nazis remained throughout the regime. This reflects how unimportant the cabinet was. Hitler did not really believe in an orderly system of government, and increasingly decisions were made ad hoc, and on an individual basis. Now, the Enabling Act had given the cabinet power. However, in practice, laws were just issued through Hitler, drawn up in the Reich Chancellery, and then passed through the cabinet without them even meeting, okay? So um, what we see is some evidence for the lack of power that the cabinet exercised at this time is that while it met 72 times in 1933, by 1936, this had dropped to four, and by 1939, this had dropped to zero. So it's increasingly abandoned as an actual mechanism for discussion and for um, you know, veto and talking about ideas. It becomes virtually unimportant. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is the Reich Chancellery. Now, this is far more important. Um, the central administrative body who greatly expanded its role. After the Enabling Act, most laws and decrees were drawn up by the Chancellery officials. It was responsible for coordinating the responses of departments to new legislation, um, and they issued government decrees and dealt with the increasing paperwork, including letters to Hitler. Now, Hans Lammers was the head of this organization, and in his role, um, he had huge influence and control over what information flowed to and from Hitler. Therefore, he had really, really significant influence over Nazi policy. He could control what got to Hitler, and he could control what left Hitler. So Hans Lammers is very, very, very important in the law. Now, finally, I'm going to talk to you about the law itself. Now, Hitler obviously did not want to be bound by the law. And as the Nazi concept of authority was based on the leadership principle, this idea that Hitler is kind of, you know, all knowing, all important in this Nazi state, it's fitting that he should have total control and liberty to act in any way he wished. 
Essentially, Hitler's word was law. The Nazis did not introduce a new constitution or legal system after 1933. Instead, they introduced some new laws to deal with political offences and forced the existing justice system to adapt to their needs. They also introduced new courts and police organisations to ensure that political opponents were dealt with. Um, this meant that the legal principles of Weimar Germany were no longer applicable. Citizens were no longer treated equally before the law. Judges are no longer able to operate independently of the government and individuals could be arrested and imprisoned without trial or evidence. Essentially, this means the law has become arbitrary and inconsistent. In summary, laws could be passed in three ways of which two were still the same as under the Weimar system the Reichstag or presidential decree. Both of these methods, however, died out gradually after the Enabling Act and the cabinet guided by the Reich, Reich Chancellery, sorry, passed these laws instead. Um, so really what we have is a complete takeover of the legal system without any real consistent rewriting of how it's going to work. So if we were evaluating it, we might say that it becomes an important element of the terror state. However, like much of the German system, the Nazi system, it relies on individual decisions. It relies on an ad hoc basis. Um, and it relies on the idea of the Hitler myth, to be quite honest, this idea of Hitler dictating everything within Germany. Now, I'm going to go through the court system next. So, Franz Gertner, um, the non-Nazi justice minister from 1933 to 1941 supported an authoritarian state, but one that existed based on a system of law. Judges and lawyers were generally very conservative. However, few belonged to the Nazi party in 1933. The problem for the Nazis was that terror and intimidation carried out by the SA and the SS was clearly illegal. And in the first instance, there were many lawyers who wanted to uphold this view. This led to many prosecutions against stormtroopers. And in addition, after the Reichstag fire, the Supreme Court had acquitted all but one of the defendants. This seriously angered Hitler. They had not done what he asked. He could see this was a part of Germany at this point that he did not have control over. It was still bound by normal ideals of law and order. Now, what he does is Whilst he dismisses a few judge and state prosecutors, it was more effective for him to coordinate the justice system. And he did this by the following methods. He merged the Professional Association of Lawyers and Judges with the League of National Socialist Lawyers to create the Front of German Law in April 1933. As with many other areas of life, career prospects became dependent on adhering to the regime. 100,000 lawyers gave the Nazi salute and swore to strive as German jurists to follow the course of our Führer. From 1936, the eagle and swastika also had to be worn on judges' robes. He also created new courts and special courts were set up in 1933. Um, and people's courts were set up in 1934. Now these ran alongside the existing system and these courts were created to deal with political crimes. They had three Nazi judges and two professional ones. There were no juries and defendants had no rights to appeal their sentences. With these measures backed up by threats and intimidation from the SA and SS, judges and lawyers fell into line. The old court system continued to exist, but the justice system had no power to interfere with the Nazis' use of terror. Where individuals tried to uphold the law, the courts were simply bypassed for the SS courts, the people's courts, the special courts. Haydn, a historian, wrote that the judiciary effectively worked in favor of the regime. So basically what he's saying is that whatever the regime wanted, the law worked for. Now between 1934 and 1939, 3,400 people were tried by the people's courts, most former communists and socialists. Many were given the death penalty, which was increasingly used in the Third Reich. Under Hitler, nearly 40,000 death sentences were handed down. So in conclusion, Hitler did not create a new system of law. He passed new laws to ref reflect Nazi political views, and he expected judges and lawyers to interpret all laws according to Nazi values. 
This approach is summed up by the Interior Minister, Wilhelm Frick. Everything which is useful for the nation is lawful, and everything which harms it is unlawful. Laws could be bypassed for national need as they could be interpreted subjectively. So arguably through the law, he very much creates his own network of a system through which they could interpret the terror state. So I would suggest that the law, the court system, his manipulation of the judges and the judiciary and the lawyers is all evidence for the fact that Hitler creates a terror state in Germany.